Before I make this opening illustration, I want to clarify that I love my house, and my wife has made it a lovely home. But every time, every time, I do a project on that old house. I uncover more projects that need to be done. I cleared out the garage so Sarah could park her car in there over the winter, and mice ate every single wire in her car. And then I organized the basement, and I found a leaky pipe. We had to dig up the whole front yard and replace our water mains. One November, I went down to get the Christmas tree, had to call a specialist to get rid of all the bats that had invaded our attic and our basement. I am nervous to do it when she says, hey, can you do this? I'm nervous because I'm going to touch something and then four other things are going to break. And it is frustrating. And yet, I often feel the same way about my sanctification. The process of becoming more and more like Christ and holiness in our daily lives, there are times I'm afraid to read a new book or to study a new passage, or to think through a new practical issue, because if I do, I'm just going to expose a bunch more areas of sin that I didn't know about, and now I know about them, and I have to do the hard work to fight them. I get frustrated that I didn't already have this figured out. I get frustrated with how difficult the process is, and I get frustrated that am I really going to even make any progress on this in the first place? Is it worthwhile? Well, that is not gospel-centered Christ-exalting thinking. Remember our context in Philippians 2, Paul has just told us the glorious humility and sacrifice of Christ to spend his whole life working to fix all of my problems and save me. His glorious exaltation, where he rules and reigns over the earth, it's coming soon, where he will fix and resolve all my problems. So what right do I have in the meantime to get frustrated and give up on working to become more like him in my life. But more than just not giving up, we are called to rejoice in the work of God, to rejoice in our sanctification. So as we prepare to study God's word on this topic, would you pray with me that we would see this as a joy? Father, we confess, at least I confess, I know I am lazy and hard. I do not want to put in the hard work that sanctification requires. So I pray as we study your word that we would see this not as a burden to, be, to bear, but, but a blessing, a joy, a wonderful, glorious opportunity to be part of your work of redeeming the world and redeeming our hearts. God, help us to see this with joy. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, our rock and redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've seen Christ humbled, we've seen Christ exalted, and therefore, Paul says in Philippians 2.12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. The main verb of this passage, the commanding verb, is the verb to work out. Everything else in these two sentences modifies that and helps us explain it. And we see first and foremost, we'll just work our way line by line, word by word through this passage. We see that sanctification is founded on the past and specifically in Christ's passion. Notice Paul begins with the word, therefore. This word points us back to the glorious hymn we studied. Christ has been humbled. Christ has been exalted. So when Paul tells us work out our own salvation, he cannot mean, he cannot mean earn your salvation. Why, therefore, what else would there even be for us to do? There's no humility still needed. Christ infinitely humbled himself for us. There's no obedience still needed. Christ was obedient on our behalf infinitely and perfectly to the point of the cross. There's no sacrifice or atonement still needed. Christ paid for our sins. There's no confirmation still needed. Christ rose 
from the dead. He ascended on high. In the passion of Christ, the summary of his work, in the fullness of his salvation, there is nothing left to do. So Paul cannot mean earn your salvation. It's already been earned. Rather, as Paul said in 128, our salvation is from God. He has graciously granted to us the faith with which we respond to the gospel. That's why Paul, remember, he's writing in 1 1, he says, To all the saints who are in Christ Jesus. We're already saints. We're already holy. We're already in Christ. We don't need to earn this. He's writing to Christians, those who are already saved. So when Paul says, Therefore, he's getting all this background and bringing it forward into this command especially in 127 where Paul told us let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ we don't earn the gospel by being worthy that is the entire point of the gospel is that we cannot be worthy we need Christ and because we have the gospel we therefore live worthy of its message not to earn it but as a free response of having been given it we have assurance and hope that Christ has earned our salvation. And this assurance and hope is not only between us and Christ, it is also within the church. It is, even our sanctification is founded in the partnership with our church. For Paul, notice he says, therefore, my beloved, my beloved. Paul is one of the founding pastors of their church. He loved them deeply. He uses this as a motivation throughout his letters. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Paul is not ashamed to call his people to obey based on his love for them. The church members were his siblings, those he loved, those he longed for, his joy, his crown, his beloved. He loved them dearly. And Christians today should have that same love for their pastors and for their fellow church members, and that love should motivate obedience. It's not just a gushy, happy feeling. It's not the Valentine's Day kind of love. It's real biblical love, and real biblical love leads to change. We see this throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 13, that passage that is always read at weddings, which is fine, whatever, but that's not what it's about. It is about the love between church members for one another. That results in changed lives and changed love and changed hearts and changed people. First John, this letter that is all about love. Who is the recipient of that love? Who is it that we love? One another, all throughout the book. John doesn't just write it to Christians generally. He's writing to the Ephesian church telling them, you should love one another. Love your fellow church members. Love your family, your church family. The fact that we are beloved should motivate us to push on in sanctification. Our sanctification is founded on what's already true about us, that we're saved and loved by Christ, and secondly, that we are loved by our church, and that pushes us on. And third, our sanctification is founded in our patterns. Paul says, I want you to grow in obedience as you have always obeyed, as you've always obeyed. We don't often talk about habits as a good thing, but God has been so gracious to allow us to form habits. Yes, we have bad habits, but when's the last time you had to think about how to tie your shoes or how to start your car or how to get here from your house? The fact that we can build habits is a wonderful work of grace in our creation because, yes, we easily build bad habits, but we can just as easily build good habits. And this was true for the Philippians. Paul tells them, I want you to obey as just as, just like, in the same way you've already been obeying. Because this is who you are, you're loved by Christ, and you're loved by your church, and you already have these habits of obedience, you can keep growing. This is good news. We're already trusting in the therefore, in the salvation, in the gospel of Christ. That's already true. We are already beloved. The church has already declared their love for us most clearly in membership. We already are living in obedience. We already have those habits. So Paul is not calling us to start over. This is, this is so important. When you wake up each day to start the Christian life, you're not starting over. You're starting on this huge foundation of everything that's come before in your life, and that is a blessing. We don't have to earn salvation. We already have it. We don't have to earn love from the church. We already have it. We don't have to learn how to obey God for the first time every day. We already have it. 
Our work in sanctification is not an attempt to earn status with God. It's living out the status we already have. Think of the, the immigrant who finally achieves citizenship in this country. Imagine if, you know, he has the big party, has the ceremony, he's given his card, he's a citizen, and then every day he's just terrified that he's going to get deported. That would make us sad because they have their citizenship. They need not fear anymore. In the same way, we already have our salvation. We don't need to fear losing God's love or God's pleasure. We don't need to fear these things. The point of citizenship is it frees the immigrant to no longer be an immigrant, one, and two, he's free to work, he's free to serve, he's free to travel, he's free to do whatever he wants because he is secure. In the same way, our sanctification is founded on the freedom of what God has already done in our lives. We're not starting over. We are rejoicing in what God has already done and walking in freedom as a result. Sanctification is not a burden we must bear. It is a purpose for which we now are free to pursue without the burden of having to try to earn it, without that burden. But obviously, as Christians, we can't simply maintain what we already do, right? Sanctification isn't maintenance. Sanctification is growth, and it's change, and it's love, and it's progressive. So Paul says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, and he doesn't just stop there, he continues, so now not only my abs- or presence, but much more my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We keep growing, for sanctification is progressive. It's advancing, it's growing, it's changing, and it, um, God, Paul calls us to pursue sanctification with perseverance. That's that word, work out. We'll talk about that first. We're jumping ahead a little bit, but that word, work out, is so important. A workout is not lifting one dumbbell one time. It's a full and complete routine. You go there, you do the workout, and then you, it's not just one thing. We also, we don't say something worked out until it's over, until it's completed, until it's finished. The idea of working out is not starting a project and then giving up. The idea is we start the project and we work on it until it's done. In Greek, the word was used of completing a job or a military campaign. You didn't just march a Roman army in, fight one battle, be like, all right, good enough. No, you conquered the enemy. You put them in submission. And Paul uses this word throughout his writings in the same way. In Ephesians 6.13, he says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, that's that same word as work out, having worked out to stand firm. You don't fight against the enemy by fighting one battle and be like, nah, good enough, I'll just rest now, they can do what they want. You keep fighting until the war is over. Or in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul says, Godly grief produces, it works out a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. It's something that God works in us to completion, not partially, but to completion. 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says this light momentary affliction that we face is preparing for us, is working out in us, that same word, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. In other words, Paul is not calling us to obey once and be done with it. That would be way easier. We just had to obey Christ once and then we're just good. That's not how it works. As Eugene Peterson put it, it's long obedience in the same direction. We keep on working. We keep pressing on. We keep making changes. We keep progressing in our faith and obedience. We persevere. And this is the kind of thinking all throughout the book of Philippians. Chapter 1, Paul prays for the Philippians' love to abound more and more, not until they're a little bit more loving, but until the day of Christ. Next week in chapter 2, John's going to show us how God calls us to hold fast to the word of life, not until the pressure lets up or it gets easier, but until the day of Christ. In chapter 3, Paul shares his own life. He presses on towards Christ, not until he's a little bit more holy, but until he hears the upward call of the prize of Christ. Over and over again, Paul calls the Philippians to work out their salvation, to keep on working, to persevere, to keep growing, to keep making changes. And you say, yeah, but I've already been so faithful. Like I did all that. Can I be done? Can I take a break? Can I be done now? Well, Paul tells us we must obey in the present. Notice he says, as you've always obeyed, so now. When is now? It's right now. It's always, it doesn't matter if you read this verse today or tomorrow or 30 years from now. It's still now. So now obey. We cannot look back at our obedience and think, look, God, I was faithful to you then. I fought that battle then. I won that spiritual fight yesterday. 
I'm just going to give in today because I fought it yesterday. I won yesterday. That's not how it works. We're called to obey now, not when it's convenient. And that's, that's my heart. I'm like, look, I'm sick. I'm tired. My stomach hurts. I don't want to obey now. I'll obey when I feel better. That's not what Paul, Paul uses the word now four other times in this book. Chapter 1, verse 5, and verse 30 now refers to his imprisonment. Not very convenient. Chapter 1, verse 20 now refers to his upcoming trial where he may be beheaded. Not a very convenient time. In chapter 3, verse 18, Paul tells them that now is a time of tears because his former friends walk as enemies of the cross, not convenient. God has not called us to pursue obedience when it's easy. He's called us to pursue obedience all the time. Now, every day. And not just like we did, but much more, many times more, increasingly more. Paul takes two different words for more and he just shoves them together. It's more, more. And I think this is important for us to grasp because I have often found that much of our frustration with growing in holiness is a result of unreasonable expectations. So I saw a clip this week. You've probably seen it or heard of it. It's this this young girl. I don't know if she's a young millennial or whatever that generation after that is. She just started her first full-time job after college. She's working 40 hours a week. She spends 30 minutes in the car to get there and 30 minutes to get back. And she's just crying on TikTok because it is so hard. She doesn't have time for her friends. When is she supposed to work out? When is she supposed to go out and celebrate? When is she supposed to clean? I have to work 40 hours a week. This is impossible. And she's just weeping. And when I first watched that, you know, my my answer was like, yeah, it's it's life. Like, what's your problem? We think they need a wake-up call, but I think that many of us need the same wake-up call in our Christian life. We're getting rejected when we share the gospel. Our temptations are not going away immediately. The battle against sin starts again every morning until we fall asleep. And many of us, like that girl, we're frustrated and we're crying and we're angry about it. We say, it's not fair. Why do I have to do all this? Friends, that's the Christian life. We don't deserve an easy life. We don't deserve to take it easy. We don't deserve more rest. And that's not what God has called us to. He's called us to a life of change and fight and war. What does Paul say? He says, work out your own salvation, not lazy boy your salvation. We work out. We put in effort. We strive. Yes, God has promised us glorious, peaceful, joyful rest. We talked about that in Sunday school. But the rest is not promised in this life. That is for the next life. That's why we want Jesus to come back soon. If you're like, man, but I'm so tired. Yeah, that's why we pray Jesus come back quickly but we don't expect that today. We don't expect that rest now because if we expect that rest now, we're just going to be disappointed and frustrated and annoyed and overwhelmed. That's not what God has called us to. So let me push us to consider in what areas do we have unrealistic expectations? Do I expect my marriage to be easy, my spouse to understand me, and our communication to be simple? Do I get lazy with my relationship because, man, I was really nice to her last week, so just carry some of that goodwill over. I'm not going to put in the same effort this week. Do I expect my work to be fulfilling, easy, and peaceful? Do I stop putting in effort because I think I've earned the right to slack off? Like, man, I worked really hard in the first quarter, so second quarter, I'm good to slack off. (coughs) Do I expect my singleness to end and to meet someone on my timeline? Do I stop pursuing purity and holiness as I wait because I've already waited so long, God, why would you make me wait longer? Do I expect my children to be quickly obedient, to learn everything the first time? And you say, no, I wouldn't expect that. Well, do you get angry when you have to teach them again? Do we start taking shortcuts, skipping instruction? We're just disciplining. Do I expect unbelievers around me to believe the first time I mention Jesus? Do I stop sharing after a while because, man, I've I've already told them about Jesus a couple times. I'm not going to waste my time doing it again. What's the point? Friends, when you read Genesis 3 and you see the curse of sin and God says there's going to be thorns and thistles, there's going to be pain, your relationships are going to be broken, your work's going to be broken, life is broken, there will be death. And then we, we read that and we think, man, why isn't my life better? Because of sin. And until sin is defeated, our life will be hard. So don't think life is supposed to be easy. It's not. It's supposed to be hard. 
Well, it's supposed to be easy, but we messed it up with sin. One day it will be easy again, but until then, it's going to be hard. We have to have those right expectations. God calls us to persevere. He calls us to obey right now. He calls us to obey more today than we did yesterday, to keep on growing, not to pursue an easy life or to be frustrated or bitter because we're having to put in the effort, but to keep working hard for the glory of God. And you may say, okay, 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 I I can't take it easy. I get it. But can, can I blame other people for my lack of growth? Oh, man, I wish. But what does Paul say? He says, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. We must strive personally to grow. As much as we stress in our church the importance of living life together as a church body, we cannot be completely dependent on others for our sanctification. We must work out our own salvation. I can't work on your salvation. You can't work on mine. We work on our own salvation. We all know people who act a certain way when they're in the presence of the church or the pastor, but then at home, in the absence of accountability, they're horrendous sinners. And I don't say that condemningly. I was one of them. Before I was saved, I was the first one at church. I was the first one to serve. I mean, like, I moved chairs around that fellowship hall like nobody's business. I was the last one to leave. But then at home, when no one could see me, I would indulge in secret, secret, unrepentant sin. If our obedience is based on the presence of others, it's not obedience. It's performance. It's not for God's glory. It's for our own. So, friends, listen, I love you. Our church loves you. But if you don't strive to work on your own salvation, it doesn't matter how much we love you. You have to work on your own salvation. So friends, are we living a double life? Do we put on a good show and a loving marriage and a happy home when we're in public, but at home we scream and we fight and we bitterly hide from one another? Do we offer to read the Bible and pray at church, but at home we don't even pick it up or think to spend time with God on our own? Do we act like we have it all together? When people ask us how we're doing, we say, oh, I'm fine. We lie to them. When in reality we're depressed and anxious and fearful, consumed with addiction. Friends, listen, if that's you today, I pray you would repent. God calls you to work on your own salvation, not to just throw it all up in the air and make others deal with it. But the joy is that while He calls us to work on our own salvation, He doesn't call us to work on our salvation on our own. We get to work together as partners. Look back with me to Philippians 1.1. Who's the letter addressed to? Not an individual, not Christians generally, but to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. This letter is addressed to all the saints in the city of Philippi who are submitted to the same group of overseers slash elders slash pastors, same elders, and the same deacons. They're served by the same deacons. In other words, it's written to the members of the church of Philippi. We see this emphasis in the way Paul is written. In English, if I say, work out your own salvation, you don't know if I mean you personally or you as a group. So we could translate, it's clear in the Greek, we could read verses 12 and 13 this way. Therefore, my beloved church members, based on what it says in one one. As you all have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, you all work out you all's own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you all. This whole sentence is in the second person plural. He's talking to you all. We are commanded to work out our own salvation together. We are encouraged because God is at work in us together. He's not talking to individual Christians, but to the church. Is God at work in individual Christians? Yes, that's true. That's not what Paul is getting at here. He's working in us. Martin and Hawthorne in their commentary, they said this, in light of Paul's focus in the context on unity in the church, the command to work out your own salvation is to be understood in a corporate sense, not in a business sense, but in a congregational sense, altogether sense. The entire church, which had grown spiritually ill, is charged now with taking whatever steps are necessary to restore itself to health, integrity, and wholeness. And thus we hold these two truths in tension. I must personally work out my own salvation. And I must partner with others to work on my own salvation with others in the church. But I'm responsible. And you say, man, how do those two things go together? Well, a bunch of stuff we talk about seems to be two things that don't seem to go together. But do. The only way to succeed is to work out our salvation together. That is how God designed us is to work in relationship with one another. So let me make three quick points of application 
on those two points. First, get help in your sanctification. If you're living a double life, if you're hiding your sin, confess and repent and get help. This doesn't minimize your responsibility to grow and change personally. Rather, the very best way to work out your own salvation is to confess your sins and get help from your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you want to work out your salvation, your own salvation, the way you do it is you get help. That's how you grow. If you have sins you've been failing to overcome, depression, anxiety, lust, addiction, anger, gossip, whatever it is, your church longs to help you. <coughs> Friends, we are, not, we are not a country club of healthy Christians. We're a hospital of deathly sick Christians who need each other. So pursue your own salvation and sanctification by pursuing it with your church. Get help. Application number two. Let me speak to those here who are not members of their church. You are missing out on one of the most important sources of growth in the Christian life. Every Christian in Philippi was a member of that church. There were no Christians who were not members. Every single one was submitted to the same elders, served by the same deacons, and united in love to the same members of their church. And because of that mutual commitment, they were able to work together and strive for progress and growth. Think about every other area of our life. When you start a business or you, you join a company, you sign a contract, you make a commitment, you work together. You're, you're not just like your boss is going to just let you show up if you kind of want to. You got to sign a contract. When you buy a house, the bank isn't like, yeah, we trust you. No, they make you sign a lot of contracts. When we decide to start a family, what do we do? We don't just move in with someone. We get married and we covenant with them to pursue that together. When things are important in our life, we make commitments. And because of those commitments, we can trust and grow together as partners towards a common goal. How much more so then should we make commitments to God's church? So if you're visiting, we're glad you're here. But do not tarry as a visitor. Do not keep coming and consuming and using the church selfishly to help yourself. Instead, make a commitment. Pour into others. Love others. Be loved by others. Submit to others. That is how God has designed us. That is how we grow. That is how God is most primarily at work. And third, let me speak to the area of financial giving. When you give money to the church to support our ministry... You are literally giving money to your sanctification. It's a one-to-one. -one. And to the sanctification of those around you. Those funds are used to prepare sermons and to teach the word and to preach that you may grow. The funds are used to fund lady Bible studies and biblical counseling and evangelism. And yes, to heat and cool and provide indoor plumbing to this building. Because when we meet in this building, we are free to share the gospel and encourage one another and grow in sanctification. I can think of no better investment for our earthly wealth than our spiritual growth and the spiritual growth of the people around us who we love. Work out your own salvation and partner with others by giving financially to support the work of your local church. God has commanded us to pursue sanctification. And friends, this command is not something to be taken lightly. We can't hear verse 12 and think, yeah, I, I mean, I'll get around to it. That's not what Paul says. He says we do this with fear and trembling. Paul is calling us to have this as our highest priority. When the authors of the New Testament use fear and trembling together, they are not describing terror or panic or shame or, or fear of death. They are describing the respect and awe and fear that comes upon a person when they stand before the one who has ultimate authority. Fear and trembling together are like, a, it's a very specific phrase that's used. We see it in Mark 5. The woman, healed of the issue of blood, knowing what had happened to her, that she had been healed, came in fear and trembling and fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. Why was she fearful and trembling? Not because she thought Jesus would hurt her. He just healed her. She was fearful and trembling because she knew who Jesus was and what he had authority to command her to do, and she was ready to obey. 2 Corinthians 7, Paul describes the church's response to Titus when he arrived and taught them the word of God. Titus remembers the obedience of the Corinthians, how they received him with fear and trembling. Were they afraid Titus was going to beat him up? No. They believed he was preaching the word of God and thus had authority to command them and they were ready to obey. 
In Acts 16, when the Philippian jailer realized Paul and the other prisoners filling their cells, he fell down before Paul and his team with trembling and fear. Not because he was afraid of his life. He had just put his sword down. He wasn't going to kill himself. He knew he wasn't about to die. Rather, he knew the God who they served was worthy of all obedience, worthy of all honor, worthy of all service, worthy of all his alleged honor in Rome. He would give that up to serve this God. This is Paul's meaning here. He is not calling us to be afraid of God as though we fear he would destroy us or be disappointed in us or would reject us. No, we fear and tremble before him because we recognize how great he is, how worthy he is, that he has the authority to command us and that we must obey. Our fear and trembling lead us to see his glory and grow in obedience to his commands as our highest priority. Nothing else is more important. Walter Hansen writes how the context makes this point. Uh, He says, meditating on the picture in the Christ hymn of all created beings bowing before Jesus and acknowledging him to be Lord should certainly generate fear in our hearts of the awesome majesty and power of the Lord of all the universe. Not fear that drives us away from the Lord, but fear that drives us to him as the only one worthy of our attention and effort. So friends, are you struggling to find motivation to obey God and pursue sanctification? Let me encourage you. This is what you can't do. Don't sit there and just try and well up obedience. Don't sit there and think, man, I know I need to do it. I know I'm supposed to do it. I just got to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Who are you thinking about? You. And thinking about you is what got you in the situation in the first place. Instead, Think of God. Learn of God. Grow in your understanding of God. The more we know who God is, the more we desire to please Him. The more we see His glory, the more we long to glorify Him. The more we see His good works, the more we want to be part of His good works. The more we know God, the more we pursue God. This is exactly the point Paul makes in verse 13. If we define sanctification as becoming more and more like God then knowing God more deeply will motivate us to become more like Him. And at the same time, knowing more of who God is will give us hope as we strive. When we look at God, we see the sanctification is promised in His person, in who He is. Notice verse 13, Paul says, Grow in your obedience, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Paul is reminding us of our motive and our hope in sanctification. That's why he uses four. We obey obey now as always because for it is God who works in us. We work out our salvation for because God is at work in us. We fear and tremble because God is at work in us. And that's, I love the way, he doesn't just say, hey, God works in you. He says, it is God who works in you. Those words are unnecessary linguistically. He is emphasizing, look, it's not Paul that's at work in you. It's not Andrew that's at work in you. It is God who is at work in you. And who is this God that is at work in you? It is the faithful God who works in you. He won't abandon you. He won't get bored. He won't give up. It is the merciful God who works in you. He won't become angry. He won't become frustrated. He won't get impatient. It is the all-powerful God who works in you. He won't face sin or temptation. He cannot overcome. It is the sovereign God who works in you. He won't lose control of the situation. It is the holy God who works in you. He's not going to leave you unchanged. It is the jealous God who works in you. He will not allow you to pursue other loves or joys. It is the wise God who works in you. He won't push you too far. He won't make a mistake. He won't call you to do something you can't. It is the loving God who works in you. He won't see you as simply a project to get done. He adores you and he wants to see you change. This is the God who is at work in you. The infinite God who's worthy of all power and all glory and all honor and all might is at work in you. He made earth and sky, galaxy and atom, oceans and desert, angels and humans and animals and bugs and algae and microorganisms. The God who made all these and upholds all these is at work in your soul to make you holy. So friends, let us never say, I I can't change in this area. That's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. Because the God of all power is at work. And if I say I can't change, I'm saying God can't change me. 
blasphemy. Let us never give in to fear or doubt. Let us never accept the excuses. We were born this way. It's simply our nature. It's a character flaw, something I have to cope with. God forbid we ever speak that way. It is God who works in us. He's greater than our genetics, our personalities, our upbringing, our addictions, our conditions, our psychology, our desires, our past failings, our laziness. He's greater than all of these. And He is the one who is at work in us. No matter what we face, God is greater. And in His person, who He is, in His character, we have hope to change. And not just that. We have hope in His power, for God works in us, both to will and to work. If you're afraid, you're not strong enough to grow. I have wonderful news. It is God currently, right now, is, right in this moment, and every moment. It is God who is giving you the will, the desire, the passion, the drive, the purpose, the choice, and the work itself, the doing, the putting in effort, the achieving, the choices. We must not fear. God is at work in both our will and our works. He is working. He's energizing. He's putting power in us to obey. Friends, sanctification is not a burden. It is a blessing because we get to work with the holy God as we pursue holiness. Listen, I'm, I'm not a good cook, but if Gordon Ramsay is in the kitchen with me, cooking with me and pushing me and teaching me, the food's going to turn out pretty well even if I'm in the way a little bit. I'm not a good golfer, but if Tiger Woods and I are playing together, if he's helping me drive and putt, I, I bet we could beat anybody here. I'm not good at painting, but if Vincent Van Gogh is working on the same painting with me, I bet it's going to look pretty good. How much more so then do we have hope to pursue holiness when the holy God is at work in us? Because God is not simply good at being holy. Gordon Ramsay's good at cooking, but he's not cooking itself. God is holiness itself. He's really good at holiness. So when you feel like you can't obey, God has promised to work in you. He's promised to give us a will to be holy and to work to put that into practice. So, so little ones, here's your application. You may think you are too small to serve or obey God. But if you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, He has promised to give you His power. He is more powerful than Superman and Spider-Man and Elsa combined. More powerful than all of them. And he gave you that power to obey him. So when you don't feel like you can share with your sibling, which I get is tough, when your parents tell you to be patient, which how could they? Or when they tell you to eat broccoli and you don't want to eat broccoli. Remember that God has given you his superpower to obey in moments just like that. You can never say, oh, I couldn't do it. You could if you trust in Christ. He gives you that power. You have the power of God to share that toy or wait or even eat broccoli. He empowers you to do it. God has promised us his power to obey. Yet when we consider the greatness and holiness of God, we may fear, what's the point? We're never going to do it perfectly. It's always going to be flawed. We're going to fail. We're going to mess up. You are correct. But here's the final words of this verse. God has promised that when we pursue sanctification, we pursue it in God's good pleasure. God, our Father, is pleased in our efforts at growing in holiness. Yes, we could do better. No one's arguing that. Our efforts are imperfect. Again, we're all agreed. But God is working in us for His good pleasure. He is pleased by our stumbling and striving. He delights in sin-stained sanctification. Parents, think about your kids. When they sing in the school play and they're kind of pitchy, you're like, man, that was a waste of time. What did I even show up for? When they play in the championship game and they miss a few shots, when they learn to walk but they fall over like a hundred times every day trying to do it, are you like, man, what is wrong with this kid? Why am I even feed them. Like, what's the point? No, you love them. You rejoice in how they're growing. And they stumble and they fail. And their drawings don't look like whatever they say they look like. But you are pleased in their attempts. You rejoice in their work because you love them. And they are working for your good pleasure. We see this all throughout the Bible. 
Psalm 147, 11, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. God is pleased when we trust him. He's pleased when we humble ourselves. Psalm 149, 4, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. And you say, but what about when I sin? Proverbs 3, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord approves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Even when you sin, God delights in you. Because even when your kids mess up, you still love them. You get to help train them and teach them and show them how to do it right. And you may say, well, I don't feel that way. Well, let me point you to one of my favorite verses. Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. This reminds me of Paul's words. It is Yahweh who is in your midst working among you. He is mighty. He's promised to save. And even though you will need saving, he will absolutely and without question, he will rejoice over you. And somehow rejoice with gladness. He'll rejoicingly rejoice. He's excited to do it. And when you say, but how could he love me? How could he delight in me? How could he be happy in all my failures? Man, God will quiet you by his love. He will overwhelm you. He'll drown out your doubts with his own loud singing of joyful exultation. So let me, as, as we close, let me address the unbelievers who are here. The reason that this verse is true, the reason that God delights in his people is not because they are better than you. It's because of Christ who humbled himself for us and was exalted for us. If you are not in Christ, God is not at work in you, and thus it is impossible for you to please God. You cannot earn his pleasure by good works or financial gifts or acts of service, yet there is hope, for in Luke 15, 7, Jesus said, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 allegedly righteous people who say they don't need to repent. Friend, if you would confess that Jesus alone is able to make you holy and worthy, if you would repent of your sinful rebellion, if you would trust in Christ as the Savior who's come to save you from your unrighteousness, that you're the lost sheep who wandered away, then not only will the God of heaven rejoice in you, all of heaven will rejoice in you, in you specifically. And you say, I'm too far gone. It's too late. God wants to rejoice in you. Heaven wants to have a party in your name. If you would repent and be saved. If that's you, talk with me, talk with somebody before you leave. We would love to help you come to know the God who rejoices in his people. Believers, that joy is not just that party at the beginning and then God just doesn't care anymore. God is still rejoicing over you. So when you feel unloved, and unwanted, and it feels like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling when you've been striving for sanctification and almost entirely failing in every way, and you're like, man, God could not possibly be interested in me. Open God's word and hear the beautiful song of his love for you. Allow the truth of the word to drown out your doubts and your fears as you bask in his rejoicing. Allow your soul to be quieted by his faithful love. Allow your heart to be filled with peace as you hear your God exult over you with loud singing, he is at work in you for his good pleasure. He has promised to be pleased in you, not because you deserve it, but because God in Christ has already earned all that is needed. I know that sanctification is a long, hard road. Every time we flip over a rock, we have new problems, but we press on because God is rejoicing in our work. It is for his good pleasure. When we look at the character of God, when we hear his joy in heaven, we are encouraged to continue our pursuit of him. So with that in mind, let's pray together. Father, we are thankful that your word is true because our flesh and our guilt and our shame call us to just feel bad, to feel separated, 
to feel unholy and wretched and focus in our sin, but Christ humbled himself for us. He was obedient for us, even to the point of death on the cross for us. He rose for us. He ascended for us. There is no sorrow or wrath left for us because of Christ. God, I pray. Let us hear the joy of heaven. What you said to your son that he is your beloved son and in him you are well pleased. You will say the same thing to us when we join you in your presence. God, help us know that and believe that. And because that is true, pursue you in faith today. God, help us know who you are and trust in your promises. Help us work progressively to grow, trusting in what you've already done in the past that you may be glorified in our sanctification. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, in a moment, we're going to stand and, and sing Rock of Ages. The first verse says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, Jesus, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. I wanted to end on this song because, man, we talked a lot about what we have to do. But let's end thinking about what Christ has done. He's already been cleft for us. He is the double cure. He makes us forgiven and pure. Let's stand and sing.